Hi everyone, my name is Miguel de Villa, and I'm an applications engineer here with Go Engineer. And today I wanted to share with you this quick how-to video on making a flex cable inside of SolidWorks using in-context assembly modeling techniques so that the flex cable itself is able to update its shape and size depending on the position of the two components it connects. And in this process, we're going to learn the limitations of this modeling practice, its benefits, as well as go into the basics of in-context assembly modeling, virtual parts, and the path length sketch dimension constraint. So without further ado, let's get started. The first step in this process of defining a part in the context of the assembly is always to first have and complete your assembly, especially the components that you want to base your part off of. Here a, I have a simple example of a moving platform on a rail that's able to traverse between these two endpoints right here. And in addition, I have two tiny boxes right here and right here that illustrate the ends or connector ends of this cable. And I am going to create a brand new part that has a simple thin extrusion that that will be coincident to and connect with these two black boxes and subsequently I want it so that when I move this moving stage right here to an intermediate position that new part is able to automatically update and reshape itself to suit. So now that I have my assembly all set in order I'm going to create a brand new part. Normally we go right up here hit new in order to make a new part this time I want to introduce you guys to the concept of virtual parts. To do so we go right here under insert components and we hit new part. And We can see that this creates a new part. It's got its own feature tree, reference planes and so on. But take a look at the name. It says part 5 and then it says flex cable. This is a virtual part. This is a part that you can add features, add sketches, add mates to, but it doesn't exist outside of the context of this assembly. It's not saved out as an individual file at all. It only exists within the assembly. We can, of course, save it to an external file later on if we'd like, but for the purposes of this example, having it be defined only within the assembly itself is perfectly fine. So I'm going to go ahead and rename this to be Cable. And now, I'm going to right click on it and instead of hitting open part which opens it up in isolation I'm going to hit edit part because I want to be able to see the rest of the assembly in order to dimension to and connect to it. So I'm going to go ahead and hit edit part right here and it brings me into the edit part view. How do I know that? Well here I have my part in blue to indicate that this is the a feature tree that's currently being worked on and sure enough my tabs have the normal old features and sketch tab. This is the why I like this method. I like to introduce people to it after they've taken the essentials class because all you need to know is how to create a new virtual part and how to edit a part and suddenly you're able to make these much more intelligent um, features and sketches using basic knowledge of features and sketches just now inside of a virtual part. So now let's go ahead and hit the sketch command right here. I'm going to go ahead and start a sketch on this plane. I'm going to start out with a simple line that connects this black box to the other. It goes horizontal. Then I'm going to give it a nice tangent arc right here to represent the bend radius of the cable itself. I'll just connect it to its partner right here and just tidy this up with the appropriate horizontal and tangent relations so that as it moves it has a nice curve and bend to it. Now still my sketch is still a bit blue I need to add some dimensions and hypothetically in this instance this is going to be representative of a store-bought cable so it's going to come in at a fixed length. 
So I'm going to use a special type of Smart Dimension. I'm going to go up here to my Smart Dimension tool and select the Path Length Dimension. This allows you to select multiple sketch entities like so and assign them a number. This number, as you would have guessed, is the total length of all these entities. And it works like any other um, sketch dimension. Just type in the number that you want and it's going to go ahead and force all the relevant sketch entities to conform to that length given the other constraining dimensions and relations to them. And now my sketch is fully defined. All that remains is for me to go to my features tab, go to the extruded boss base command right here, and I'm going to settle for a thin feature that's about a millimeter thick, 25 millimeters long like so, and extrudes in this direction so it looks and simulates a cable the most closely. Because remember, this is all about interference detection. Even if it's just a dumb solid like this, it's still useful for representing the movement and position of this cable at various points of this platform's motion. And let's just give it a quick pop of color so that it's easier to see. Excellent. Now, if we take a look inside the feature tree of this virtual part that we have here, we have a brand new feature called Extrude Thin. In addition, we have a new symbol. This is an indicator that this feature, in this part, carries what's known as an external reference. An external reference is a, um, a reference to something outside of the file, be it an existing part, sketch, assembly, and so on. And the reason we have that is because our sketch now has coincident relations tying it to this end of this black box right here and this end of this black box right there. Hence why we have that intelligence and that external reference. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit exit right here, get back to my top level assembly, and let's take a look at our results. Simply static, it looks pretty good. It looks representative of the physical location of this part in this position. But let's see what happens when we move this stage. I'm going to move it to this intermediate position right here. And right off the bat, I can see that this cable that I've designed hasn't moved at all. So what gives? Well, just like when we edit a dimension inside of a part or some mates inside of an assembly, we need to first hit rebuild so that SOLIDWORKS knows to recalculate the new result given the um, new placement of the various objects within our design. Just like that. So here I am moving to a new position, going ahead and making sure to hit rebuild, control B right there, and we can see that it adapts to the new position wherever it may be, as long as we are able to um, hit rebuild and get let it recalculate. So now that we've finished the model, let's talk about some common pitfalls and limitations of this technique. Let's go back inside of the sketch right here, and let's go ahead and change this to a very short length right here. And while it looks fine now, even when we hit rebuild, because this platform is in this position, let's take a look at what happens when we move it to the end. Now, because that dimension was too short, we suddenly get an error inside of our sketch. And rightfully so. It's too short, and therefore this coincident relation right here, which is supposed to connect this sketch entity with the end of this block, can't be satisfied. So we have to either break that external relation and redo it to something that works, or change this path length back to an appropriate value. And this is just a valuable lesson that goes to show just because your parts are more intelligent and are able to respond to changes in the assembly doesn't mean they're unbreakable and doesn't mean that we get to be careless. Now we've just added an additional layer into our design intent where we have to guarantee that this part and how it's sketched out and designed is able to adequately respond to any changes in the assembly that it's based on. In addition, this is a fairly simple extruded solid right here. 
It doesn't contain any information about the connectors, wire gauges being used, and so on and so forth. That would make it a true electrical component. For that, we would need to use some of the electrical routing tools inside of SOLIDWORKS. But for the purposes of basic interference detection and collision detection, and only needing to use basic SOLIDWORKS sketches and features, we've done a pretty darn good job. This is Miguel de Villa, Applications Engineer here with Go Engineer. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. I hope you were able to pick up a couple of tips and tricks from this video. Have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm.